Well, SAG-AFTRA has an extremely strong and vibrant voiceover community. It's a community I actually love and work I adore. Uh, during the pandemic, we've actually seen a huge shift to working from home, which has been aided by technological advances uh, in recording equipment that's accessible to performers of all levels. And we've also seen organizing our colleagues do their, to continue to do this organizing from home, which is really uh, something special. So I wanna tip my cap to the voiceover members across every voiceover genre. They have really made incredible adaptions to the work from home model during the pandemic, something I wish we could all do. Over the next 15 minutes, we're gonna delve into the world of voiceover in general. We're gonna talk about how voiceover performers who traditionally worked in video games and animation are actually finding new opportunities in dubbing as a result of SAG-AFTRA's organizing efforts in the space and due to the negotiations made in our 2019 Netflix agreement. Very exciting. So to lead this conversation, I am thrilled to introduce David Urigo. Urigo. Sorry, David, for that. Uh, a David is a leader on SAG-AFTRA's uh, Los Angeles Voiceover Committee. He's also extremely involved with our allies in CODA, the Coalition of Dubbing Actors, and they've been doing great work as well. So hi, David, it's so nice to have you with us. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, letting us be here. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be here with Xander Mobis and Sarah Elmale, a couple of wonderful people that we are going to just jump right into the, the meat of this thing. And uh, as Gabrielle mentioned, obviously we have shifted to working from home a lot. So um, uh, Sarah, I'm going to ask you first, where, where have you felt that there have been disruptions or delays? Well, I think early on there was a big shift from a, you know, my I do mainly games, and then I've also, as was mentioned, have uh, it's been a big year for live action dubbing in this last during pandemic. Um, but games being my focus, I noticed it most in um, traditional AAA, meaning large scale Hollywood, big budget style video games, um, and they're getting re reorienting their production, finding ways to continue to utilize the professionalism of engineers and, and studio houses that they were used to. Um, and then sort of finding a new way to work with actors from home, actors, voice actors, upgrading their setup if maybe they just had a, um, an audition ready space to work in, you know, leveling that up to, to final um, production quality. Um, so there's a little bit of discombobulation there initially and everyone was in kind of a mad dash to upgrade. Um, but interestingly, and since I'm here to talk about in for indies, I think that indies have, you know, they have different kind of budget considerations if folks aren't familiar. Um, in the, much in the same way there are independent, there's independent film, which is experimental, lower budget, but really fulfilling, um, you know, sort of nourishing work for artists. There is a similar world of independent video games um, that are all, you know, scrappy and exciting and, and um, innovative. Um, and I think because they have those budget, different budget considerations, there, there was less of a hiccup in terms of they were, they're already using, you know, talent who have home setups that are up to their par at least. Um, so I don't think the indie community noticed it as much perhaps. Cool. Does that answer? Yeah, your question. Yeah, no, that's perfect. And Xander, how about you? Did did you feel like there were uh, a lot of disruptions and delays in in the the dubbing space? Yeah. Um. You know, it was interesting for the first I think month uh, of like lockdown. We weren't a hundred percent sure uh, how things were going to continue. There were uh, you know sessions being put on hold because it was like, uh, we'll wait until this is all over and then we'll bring <laughs> you mean? in. <laughs> right. Uh, and then, you know, uh, yeah. So it, I think there was kind of a mad scramble at the start to sort of feel out what the best way to continue was. And we pretty quickly settled into, all right, everybody, this is the, um, this is the equipment you need in order to produce uh, professional sounding audio. This is how you need to treat your spaces. Uh, and it was really nice. It was a uh, it was uh, a lot of VO people coming together and helping each other out to to really get things going. Um, and as far as slowdowns, honestly, we've kind of seen the opposite in a lot of ways uh, since yeah, we dubbing uh, has been huge over the last year, right? Yeah. Well, since Coda started organizing uh, the dubbing space, we've it's grown uh, over eight hundred and seventy percent. I believe is the number. Uh, of union contracts for dubbing work, and that's continued to grow this year. Uh, so yeah, it's that's been good actually. 
So did you guys, did, did either of you have to upgrade your home setups or were you uh, already like gangbusters ready to go? Sarah? I can, okay. Uh, well, I, uh, yeah, I um, lived next to, I used to live next to um, Amazon Studios construction and a playground. <laughs> <laughs> so I was in the exact wrong spot uh, to be in. So in the sense of upgrading, yes, I bought a house. <laughs> so like I, I moved um, whole places to leave. Um, and then I kind of did a, probably a, an individual tech hardware upgrade on um, on each piece, maybe. I, I know I replaced my interface. Actually, this is the same mic I've had for the last 10 years. So not this bit. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so, and then I, and then connectivity was a huge thing. That was another thing in Culver City was that the, the internet neighborhood wide was just absolutely choked and you could not get, there was nothing to be done about it. Um, they just, the, the internet providers had to service the area better because everyone was suddenly shifted to work from home. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, kind of on each piece, I did wind up doing a major overhaul. Um, so, uh, Xander, Sarah did some minor upgrades. Uh, <laughs> how about you? Just a few. Well, I didn't buy a house, but uh, <laughs> we did definitely have to upgrade uh, our our microphone, our preamp, our software. We really had to go through like everybody all of a sudden had to have Source Connect, which was something no one besides the techies in the community really uh, knew what was going on. So there was a while there where we were hitting like certain people in the community just being like, what does port not mapped mean? Help. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, it's, it's been a, a major overhaul. Nice. Uh, and so Sarah, I, I found your answer to this when we were preparing pretty interesting, but how, how do you feel that the um, casting process is, is different during, during this time? <laughs> what did I say? How's the casting process different during this time? As far as who's up for consideration based on their tech setup or? That's a, that's a good inroad. <laughs> Just um, answer organically. I'm sure it'll work. I don't remember <laughs> what I said that intrigued you and now I'm in my head about it. But um, <laughs> casting process, let me think. I mean, I, I suppose there's that always that layer of consideration now where there's, you know, you, people are looking for, um, you know, certainly with commercials, I would say there's there's no longer m as much wiggle room for whether or not you have a competitive or a final polished sounding setup at home. Mm. Um, I'm hearing um, industry folks weigh in and say that they they may never go back into physical studios. I think there's a big difference. So so again, this is based on the ta on the talent then to have if they want to be in you know available to that kind of work, um, having that setup becomes more important. I do suspect that um, games. I I don't know, and I'm not a mind reader, so I'd hate to make a prediction not hold me accountable but um <laughs> but that they you know there is the the nature of engineering a game because of the exertions that you you know when when some things are quite loud that you do all of a sudden out of context i, I find my relationships with my engineers are deeply significant for games um and <laughs> you know there may be a need for consistency across many multiple performers that would lead them to want people on the same equipment and in a controlled space so so as far as how that impacts the talent games may eventually go back I would say when we can, or are some in some cases going back, but um, absolutely, I think uh, prelay animation is likely to do the same. Um, but Xander, do, do you feel like the casting process has changed very much for the dubbing space? Um, I don't think so. I, I think there does have to be consideration now, uh, not just on hey, is the acting good, but does it also not sound like they recorded it in a bathroom? Mm -hmm. um whereas before you know plenty of people used to record their reads on their cell phones right. um you know so i i think that is a new consideration uh but as far as like what what they're looking for in a in a performance or, or those kinds of things no all right so now for some meat and potatoes uh in in a couple of minutes sarah what can you tell us what is in for indies and we're, we're going to talk a little bit about like actually organizing from home now and and if you can highlight technology even better highlight technology um yeah how do i summarize like multi many multiple years of organizing in two minutes but it's <laughs> so in for indies as i mentioned there is this world of indie games and i had come out of um as someone who had focused on games professionally and creatively for a long time i came out of indie games into and moved to LA and, and kind of joined the world of AAA as well. But that was my passion and my background always. And I never kind of wanted to lose sight of it, even as I discovered other work and enjoyed other work. Um, so uh, the low budget agreement um, that we put together um, in the last, 
we worked on it so long. I'm trying to remember what the what the official year is. Maybe 2017. I'm not sure, but um, it was the first of its kind. So so it was the first for interactive. So we had a low budget agreements for many other kinds of work. Now we finally had a low budget agreement for indie games, um, and uh, and so we and we worked really hard to kind of. Uh, have feedback conversations like to tune it with the help of the independent developer community so the game maker community so uh, after that after all of that work making this contract we um put together an information campaign it's extremely important to me that um in the same way that or in the opposite way rather that uh students of film learn about the union and casting and it's sort of part of your education and it's assumed that it's an entity you will interact with there's there's no comparable piece of that um, in, in game development. No one comes up just sort of having a sense that one will eventually work with the union and how that works. So there's a huge need to my mind for education and outreach and awareness in getting developers to understand what the union is, what it represents, and to feel like it's accessible, legible, um, usable, all of that. So In for Indies was a Twitter campaign mainly um, to galvanize talent who are excited to work on those kinds of projects, um, talent that maybe developers have played and whose work they already appreciate, um, and to share some of that, those educational um, materials so, so that developers know more about how to go about using the contract once they know that it exists. So Outstanding. That hashtag, yeah. That's fantastic. Um, so Xander, will you give us a scoop on, on what is CODA in, in like a, a two minute blurb? Yeah, uh, so CODA is a, a, a grassroots organization, um, organizing group, boy, those were words. Uh, essentially- It's the coalition, uh, it's the um, coalition of dubbing actors. The coalition of dubbing actors, thank you. <laughs> this, is, this is why David's here to keep me, uh, to keep me honest. Um, so what we do is we, we kind of started because we looked at the, uh, at the dubbing space uh, and with streaming and stuff like that, there's more of this work than ever before. And we were like, hey, listen, the, uh, the dubbing contract is nearly old enough to drink, so it, it needs to get updated. Um, and there's so much of this work, and yet it, the the dubbing contract isn't getting used very much. Why not? So we've been really reaching out to uh, that community to get them engaged with, hey, we want this work union. We want to be working on, you know, contracts that are are fair and equitable for the people working in this space. And we're also uh, we we also worked heavily on getting the Netflix agreement uh, for dubbing, which is a, uh, a a really nice, good, fun contract that's great, and everybody loves it. Um, and a very big part of why uh, we got to sort of boom in this space, right? That eight hundred twenty yeah. percent increase is huge. Oh yeah, no. Since we introduced it, it, the 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 amount of work on that contract is skyrocketed. So um, like two sentences from each of you, how have you been able to build and sustain uh, your community and organizing campaign virtually? Sarah? Me? Well, I, I think I have to sort of sit back and now that we've done this initial campaign, I have to think more. I I'm feeling, especially with, I'm inspired by the coalition of uh, dubbing actors um, getting you know the power of numbers. Sometimes I feel like I share individual resources um, that are free for developers. And I, so I've been mainly dropping those um, to kind of shed more light on, on the subject, but I need to, I need to get some buddies in here, I think. To you, Xander? Uh, yeah, well, we've been, uh, I mean, we've much like everyone adopted Zoom. Uh, we've had to, you know, take everything that used to be in person. We used to meet in person. We used to have outreach and community events in person. Now that's all over Zoom, which means we're coordinating a lot more with Facebook. We're using, uh, you know, email chains to try and keep in touch with everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's, you know, it's more difficult than it would be in person, but we, we've managed to adopt fairly well, I think. Well, I, I think I speak for a lot of members of the community when I say thank you for everything that uh, that you're doing with with organizing more union work. I know uh, personally, I am a big fan of it. So <laughs> um, thank you for being here today. And Gabrielle, thank you for uh, letting us have have a platform to share some of this good work today. And uh, back to you. Oh, thank you, David, Sarah, Xander. I have to say, I love hearing all of this. We really, it's wonderful to see what CODA is doing and the voiceover community is doing 
and the organizing, it's, it's very exciting. So uh, it was a very uh, mighty conversation. Um, but uh, all of the heart and energy you put into supporting your fellow voiceover performers is really noticed. I just want you to know that it is noticed and appreciated. 